7.01. Okay. Wow. Great to see so many people here tonight. Thank you all for coming. So good evening. Uh, welcome to Hyde Park Town Hall. It's, uh, as I said, wonderful to see so many people here. It's a very important meeting uh, where we're going to have a presentation from Delaware Engineering on our uh, proposed Route 9 sewer district project. But uh, please join me while we pledge allegiance to the flag. Okay, I um, may have a motion to accept the minutes of the February 10th meeting. I'll make that motion. And second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so uh, we do have a couple of items on our agenda prior to the Route 9 uh, Sewer District presentation. But I'll go ahead and um, ask for a motion to open the public hearing mm -hmm. regarding the local law amending the Town of Hyde Park Code to amend the schedule of use regulations uh, to provide for two family dwellings as a use permitted in all zoning districts subject to special use permit approval and site plan approval. So no. would anyone like to speak on this? Good evening, Herbert Sweet. The stated purpose of Local Law A is to, quote, encourage residential development and affordable housing in the town of Hyde Park and to facilitate the ability of senior citizens to age in place. There's several observations. Number one, a two-family dwelling unit would require twice the minimum lot size to meet the density requirements. Few parcels would qualify, so an area variance, probably substantial, would be needed. Uh, number two, a considerable number of parcels do not meet the minimum lot size and are therefore non-conforming. This makes them ineligible for a two-family dwelling unit. Uh, number three, the Board of Health would likely find most parcels would be undersized for the septic needs for two-family dwelling units. And number four, the building code might place cost prohibitive requirements on the conversion of a single family dwelling unit to two family dwelling unit. In short, there are a lot of obstacles to meeting the objectives of the proposed local law. On the positive side though, the replacement of the bulk chart footnote P asterisk asterisk with S, special use permit and site plan approval uh, does add some clarity. Okay, would anyone else like to speak on this uh, local law? Okay, um, may I have a motion to um, extend the public hearing to um, March 23rd? I'll make that motion. I'll second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, second public hearing, um, I have a motion to open the public hearing on <clears throat> the continuation of the uh, uh, public hearing for amendments to the town code and amendments to the town's comprehensive plan <coughs> with regard to the creation of a town core zoning district. I'll make that motion. And second. A second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, would anyone like to speak on this local law? Okay, um, uh, we uh, uh, will be actually amending the one that was originally proposed and so I think at our next meeting, or on March 23rd, we will have uh, a new version of this, right? So we do have a new version. Okay. The resolution that oh, we're okay. adopting tonight is accepting the amended version of the, um, of the local law uh, and the design standards and uh, scheduling the public hearing on the amended <coughs> documents for March 23rd. And um, the two-family housing local law is now folded into this uh, local law, so it's quite possible that this will supersede the uh, two-family housing local law and we'll withdraw that at the um, uh, March 23rd meeting if we pass the Carter uh, Town Corps uh, local law. Okay. All right. And so uh, 
we'll have the new documents up on the website uh, shortly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yep. good. Okay, so, so, uh, so we're going to uh, continue that uh, to March 23rd. At 7? At 7.05. Well, that, that is, uh, yeah, yeah, at 7.05. Okay, so I'm going to defer uh, public comment till after our presentation because I think that there will be lots of information provided during the presentation on the sewer district. So um, at the uh, conclusion of the meeting, we'll have public comment. So uh, just by means of introduction, I think most people are aware that over the last uh, four <coughs> years or so, we've been working very hard on something called the Hyde Park Downtown Initiative. And uh, we've had a lot of success with it. We've been able to garner um, um, many, many um, hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants uh, to originally fund the uh, planning grant that um, started this, jump-started this process. Um, and you know, just last week, uh, both Councilman uh, Krupnik and I were down at the Association of Towns and participated in a number of workshops, and they really emphasized how all these projects really be good, begin with pl with good planning. And so um, that's why a number of years ago we started this. And uh, you really have to build on many of the things that, ha that uh, people um, who sat in these seats before um, have contributed to this Im to this idea that you know Hyde Park we're such a great place so many wonderful neighborhoods and uh, so many assets but yet what we seem to lack is a vibrant downtown and so you know going through this process uh, and again funded uh, through a New York State grant we really kind of honed in on the absence of infrastructure as the root cause for the um, the lack of businesses that we'd all like to see, especially wet uses. You know, I mean, how many times have you said, "Oh, I wish we have a, had a better restaurant in Hyde Park," or not better, but more, because we have some uh, amazing restaurants. But you know, basically, we're looking for a variety of services, a variety of of goods to buy, and uh, the absence of the infrastructure is really what limits the, those uses. So, um, you know, with again, with uh, state money and then county money, uh, we were able to fund this project of, of creating a map plan and report and an engineering report, and uh, we retained a very uh, well-regarded firm, Delaware Engineering, to um, basically begin this massive research project. And so uh, tonight we do have Mary Beth Bean Coney here uh, from Delaware Engineering, and she has uh, a presentation to go over the uh, many details, the many um, segments that go into this massive capital improvement project. And you know, I just as a as a preface would like to say, you know, that the town board has worked very hard to uh, acquire grant funding, not just for the planning, but for the construction of the of the infrastructure. And we do have 5.25 million in committed funds, um, and those funds are uh, two million came from Sue Serino, a uh, million and a half came from uh, a CFA grant that we wrote. Um, uh, 500,000 came from the county, and 1.25 million came from uh, Belfield. So, you know, these are, it's, we're rather unique in that sense that we've put together these great amount of funds uh, even prior to uh, creating the district. So the reason we did that is because we can only put in the map plan and report those funds that we have secured. Uh, and the way that this is designed is that the um, monies that will be borrowed, which um, Mary Beth will review with everyone, uh, the total cost of the project um, minus the, um, the, the committed funds that we have, the balance will be borrowed by the 109 property owners that are part of the district. Uh, that's the way New York State constructs these things, that they, uh, it's only those who benefit are allowed to pay for the district. And so um, that is, uh, in some ways um, makes it difficult because 109 properties are not a, a, a significant number to share in this in this debt service um, but that is the way it's it's designed and it is fair because uh, it's designed to benefit those people uh, and truly with the, the entire town will benefit in many ways um, we do know that uh, 
uh, when you have commercial development, it does contribute to your tax base, which brings down the cost of taxes for residents. And so that's an additional incentive, uh, and that is one way that the town benefits. And the other um, portion of, of our project, uh, besides the sewer, um, there were two other aspects that we identified as uh, ways to address this lack of vibrancy in our town. Um, the one, uh, the in addition to the sewer, then, is the pedestrian improvements. And we were very fortunate to obtain uh, grant funding for those as well. And I'm sure people have noticed the sidewalks and the lighting that we were able to build uh, without um, much, very, with very little cost to local taxpayers. That was all funded through a New York State TAP program and then a grant from Dee Dee Barrett. Um, and and so uh, that project, we complete the first phase. We completed um, actually two years ago now, but uh, since then we've been in the midst of uh, um, working with DOT on the on the uh, phase two, and uh, just recently received preliminary design approval. So those sidewalks improvements will be extending uh, from where they left off at the south end of. Park, uh, Park Plaza up to the firehouse. So uh, we're excited about that. Um, I think it's uh, uh, part of our desire to uh, create the sense of place uh, and, and to provide the infrastructure that benefits the businesses that are located there as well as the, the residents who live here. And then the third uh, component of the downtown initiative is um, actually um, coincidentally uh, on, on the agenda tonight and that is the zoning updates so in order to um, actually make those zoning updates work to their best of their ability uh, you need this infrastructure but they are designed to allow um, a more vibrant uh, feel for <laughs> properties to be brought up to the street to utilize the entire uh, um, or a, a bigger portion of the property for construction um, for higher density <laughs> Uh, development for commercial as well as residential. So um, those three components are part of our downtown initiative. And uh, um, as I said, that it's it's a it's a long process, and a, and a lot of progress has been made. And we've built originally on the 2005 comprehensive plan, which identified all these these ideas and these ways for Hyde, Hyde Park to progress. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Mary Beth Bianconi, and uh, she'll lead us through the, the details of the project. So thank you, Mary Beth, from, for coming down once again. Of course. Me too. Oh. So good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Beth Bianconi, and I'm a partner with Delaware Engineering. For those of you who have been here before, you're probably getting a little tired of seeing me. Um, I've been here for years, it seems like. Um, as the supervisor said, we're not going to spend a lot of time in history. Those of you who are here for past presentations have seen the history. I will say we work all over the state. We work from Plattsburgh over to the um, Watertown area and down through the Binghamton area, Rome, Utica, and the rest of the state. We don't work in New York City and Long Island, but this community has been incredibly proactive with this project. In my experience, this is a very, very proactive community. And the fact that you have $5.25 million in um, committed funds before you formed a district is a testament to how much work has been done by this board and, and the boards that precede it. So um, something to be congratulated for. As the supervisor said, the purpose of this project is to try to um, vi add vitality to the downtown, really create a downtown. I can't tell you how many times I say to people, well, we're working in Hyde Park on a sewer system, and first thing people say is they don't have a sewer system. I say, no, they don't. And then people are surprised to learn that from the Vanderbilt Mansion to the FDR, everyone's on a septic system. Um, that's really surprising. And when I say this to sort of people, they're surprised, but developers are going to say, that's a non-starter. How do I come and invest my money if there isn't a sewer system? So these little images that we're seeing are sort of, they're, they're images from other places, but they're that idea of having a vibrant downtown. Um, I'm not going to go over this in tremendous amount of detail. We have looked at options ad nauseum. You're seeing three little images up there. 
the, I think I can make this work where, yeah. Ooh, look at that. That one's the small one. This one's the medium one, and that one's the big one. Sort of Goldilocks land. Um, we looked at three different service areas. We looked at four different ways of treating the wastewater. Community septic system, which would be for a small scale service area. We looked at for the medium and large scale service areas, building a wastewater treatment plant with a discharge either to groundwater, meaning that the water would be treated and it would be discharged into the ground to recharge the groundwater, or a discharge to a surface water, a river. Um, and the last one we looked at was um, the Bellfield wastewater treatment plant. Folks will know that if you drive south, you'll see that they're busy constructing things down at Bellafield. For a while, we've gone back and forth as to whether that's an opportunity for um, the town to, to um, utilize the wastewater treatment plant that's being built there. Unfortunately, um, it's a challenging situation. Bellafield is in construction. We're just talking about forming a district, so they're kind of ahead of us by a bit. Also, their initial wastewater treatment plant is equal to about the size of the existing water use in that middle or sort of Goldilocks um, service area. So the treatment plant would need to double in size. Someone would need to pay for that to happen. Um, just to serve what you have today. That wouldn't give you any roof for growth. And if we think about it, the purpose of this project is to allow for development, investment, and growth, which is going to result in more wastewater. So it's a challenging situation. I know the town board entertained a proposal from Bellfield recently, but unfortunately it was too limiting. Um, and when we looked at it in sort of the grand scheme of things, very big picture, um, believe it or not, the costs ended up being very similar between what's proposed to be done by the town and what would be done to um, connect to the Bell Bellfield site. Part of the reason for that is if you think about it, when you go south out of the community, you have a long way to go before you get to the Bellfield site where there's a lot of um, public lands, and those public lands aren't paying the bill. So you're building a lot of pipe with no one to pay the bill. That makes it complicated. Um, so let's see. So the supervisor went over this. I'm not going to go over it too much at length, but you've done a spectacular job at getting funding. Um, the $5.25 million in funding is for this project. The town has gotten, I don't know how many countless other millions of dollars to do the pedestrian improvements, sidewalks, work on Route 9, street lights, and other issues. Uh, so the pr the tonight, the, what we're talking about is a proposed Route 9 commercial sewer district. And that is that sort of Goldilocks middle ground opportunity. It covers 109 parcels from Linden Lane to Twilliger Road. The collection system, which is the network of pipes that would convey the wastewater to treatment, is about 15,000 linear feet of gravity sewers and about 5,600 linear feet of force mains with two pump stations. We're using pump stations because there are times when um, we'd have to have water magically go uphill somehow, and the only way to do that is to use a pump station. Um, there are two proposed. One would be actually here at this site, and the other one would be in the southern portion of the proposed sewer district. And the force mains um, are just smaller diameter pipes that are under pressure that convey the wastewater back to where they can flow by gravity. Obviously, as you can see, the preference is to use gravity. And the reason for that is because when the power goes out, gravity doesn't stop. Now, the pump stations would have generators with them, but it's, it's really great. It's low cost. It's good to do. So we've, we've focused on gravity sewers. The wastewater treatment plant would be a state-of-the-art wastewater treatment plant using a technology called a membrane bioreactor. That is one of the um, technologies that will get us the cleanest water. We've programmed this out at 103,000 gallons a day, and that's based on building out maximum use in the corridor for things that are envisioned by the town's zoning that you're going through right now. So it's, it's not to put a semiconductor plant here. It's to do a commercial corridor with retail, housing, and mixed uses that are things that are in response to the comprehensive plan and all of the community involvement that's been gone to on to date in the zoning. So it's actually a build out analysis of what this could be. It's a vision of what this could be. So it's 103,000 gallons a day. It would have a discharge to the Crem Elbow Creek, um, which is a 
body of water that's very important and very special. And because it's very special in terms of fish propagation and in terms of its water quality, the water that comes from the wastewater treatment plant is essentially drinking water. It has to be. It has to be at that level, that quality. Um, and the location of the treatment plant is in Pine Woods Park. For folks who came up and looked before, this is, if I get this thing, oh, I might not be using the right one. Nope. Huh. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, this is the treatment plant location. Um, I know there's been some discussion about this in the community. It is in a park. And it seems like those are two things that maybe shouldn't go together. Um, it is, you know, we, in a perfect world, would we like to not have it in a park? Yes. Um, did we look extensively at locations in this area to put a wastewater treatment plant? Yes. Um, at the end of the day, this ended up being um, the most realistic location for a wastewater treatment plant. One of the things that you see in these images here are some wastewater treatment plants. I think most people think of wastewater treatment plants as being a bunch of tanks outside. They look very industrial. They're ugly. They smell, all kinds of things. This treatment plant up here is in um, Putnam County. It is called the Meadows at Dean's Corners. This is in a very, very, very exclusive housing development. This is, the this is exactly the same size as the treatment plant that's proposed for you and would be located in Pine Woods Park. And as you can see, it just looks like a, a building. You can make a treatment plant look pretty much like whatever you'd like. All of the facilities are inside the building. There's odor control here. And um, there's been no, you know, again, these are multi-million dollar houses. There's been no issues with odors, noises, lights, any of those kinds of things. It's a modern, high-end, very, very, very fancy laboratory, basically. Um, this treatment plant is in Wyndham, New York. And um, it is not uncommon. Now, this is a larger plant. This is about 400,000 gallons a day. It's about four times the size of the facility that you guys are looking at. Um, this, the operators here, this beautiful face, frequently have people pull up and knock on the door and ask for reservations because they think it's associated with the ski hill that's behind it. It's a sewer plant. So if it smelled, if it was bad, we would not have people pulling up and asking for reservations. Um, so it's just to prove that it can be done. This last one is in the village of Fleischmann's down in Delaware County. And this one um, was designed to look like a horse facility where there would be horses inside. These walls are actually very high. We've had people pull up and try to look inside them. They're, they're very, very tall. You really can't look over them, but they're expecting to see a training facility with horses in it. This is actually the interior of this. It's water. It's wastewater, actually. So again, you can make these wastewater treatment plants really look like whatever you'd like them to. Um, a couple of other things about this wastewater treatment plant. I know there's been some discussion about um, things like truck traffic, disruption in the neighborhood, those kinds of things. There are wastewater facilities that are designed to accommodate septage haulers, where a septage hauler might go out, pump out septic tanks, which I know everybody here has a septic tank, so everyone's familiar with that process. We call them honey wagons. <laughs> um, and those, wag those, those tankers would come to a wastewater treatment plant, discharge that septage, which by the way, septage smells terrible, um, into the plant and it would be treated there. And um, I will tell you that this plant, for a variety of reasons, is not designed to do that. It's not designed to do that because of the size and scale of the facility, it's too small, and just simply because it's just not feasible in this location. It wouldn't be cost effective, it's not feasible. So it is not designed for that purpose. It's, there's, there's no intention to do that here, so that's not an issue. Now one of the things about wastewater treatment though that we should talk about is um, that it is operator attended. There would be staff on site every day, 365 days of the year. They're not there 24 hours a day, but they are there Monday through Friday, generally speaking for eight and eight hour shift and on the weekends for at least four hours both days. Um, at this time, the town of Hyde Park doesn't have staff that does that, does that type of work, but your friends at the Dutchess County Water and Wastewater Authority do. So the idea would be that the professionals there would operate this facility on behalf of the town, much like they operate the water plant that's right here in town, 
um, and I don't think that causes any disruption to anyone. Um, so it would be the same kind of thing. These are just people going to work. So while they might drive a light pickup truck, they're no different than anyone else who drives a light pickup truck or a car and it goes to work at 6 o'clock in the morning and leaves at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, there will be biosolids generated by this wastewater treatment plant. The process of wastewater treatment takes solids in water, removes the solids, removes the things in the water that you don't want discharged to the environment, discharges the clean water to the environment, and then has these solids and that liquid portion that has things in it you don't want out in the world left over. That material, which is called sludge, has to be handled. In this case, because of the size of the facility, the intention is to retain it on site in a tank with odor control so that it won't be smelling or anything like that. It'll be, it's about 4,000 gallons a month. That's not very much. Um, which would result in about one truck a month to remove that material from the site, one truck. Now, just like any other facility, there will be deliveries, but they're just like the deliveries to any b business, you know, where the FedEx truck is coming and, you know, those kinds of things. We're not talking about tractor trailers. So it's actually a very, very low impact land use from that perspective. Um, the, the, we've assumed, since we're here in 2020, it's going to take us a couple of years to get this project done. So we're looking at bidding this project in late 2022 or early 2023. And the cost that's estimated, maximum cost for all of the pieces and parts, including engineering and legal costs and all those things, is $21 million. For those of you who've been at meetings before, you were hearing a number in the high $18 million, close to $19 million. And you might say, wait a minute, overnight? It went from 19 million to 21 million. What happened? Well, that 19 million dollar number was as though we were bidding it today, right now. We're not. And what we've seen in the last number of years with construction bids is that the cost of materials and labor in construction for wastewater treatment plants has been escalating at about 5% per year. The cost of everything else the people and all of the other things that go along with it has been escalating roughly 3% per year. So what we did was we took the costs that are very detailed and are in the engineering report that I believe is online, people can go look at that, and we escalated them. So folks may be familiar with the whole compounded annually. That's exactly what we did. We took, assume it was gonna be bid today, these were the costs, we escalated it through 2021, and we escalated it through 2022 to come up with that new cost. So it is a higher number, but that's a good thing. Um, we, we, we're, first of all, this board is required to identify the maximum cost likely to be expended. So we don't want to be low. Um, secondly, we want to make sure that we're accommodating the future. I don't know about you guys, but I can't tell you how much cost it's going to cost to get gas tomorrow at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I can guess. I can be real close. I can tell you it's not going to be $5 and it's not going to be a dollar a gallon, but I can't tell you exactly. And it's the same thing with bidding a construction project out into the future. We can be pretty darn close and we can look at history and we can say it's reasonable to assume that these pieces of equipment and this material is going to cost a certain amount of money. And then again, we can look and say year over year, what have we seen happen here? not in the world, but right here in our backyard in terms of cost escalation, and that's where that number comes from. So um, user costs. This is something that's very much a concern to everyone. For this project, there are two aspects to the user costs. One is the debt service, and that is being um, charged in a proportional share based on the size of the property and the frontage along Route 9 for commercial properties. This is primarily a commercial district. Of those 109 properties, most of them are commercial. There are some that are institutional and there are very, very few that are residential with some home occupation type, type uses. So those projects that are commercial, the debt service also includes that frontage on Route 9 because that's important for a commercial business. Um, debt service is the cost of the capital, taking out all of the grants. What is it going to cost to borrow that money over time at a certain interest rate? What's that annual payment? It's just like your mortgage or a car payment that you're making. Um, so that's what the debt service portion is. The other portion of the cost is something called a sewer rent. 
which is the proportional share of the cost to operate and maintain the facility based on water use. Most of the 109 properties within the district are on Dutchess County water, so we have water use data, so we use that data to estimate. The one thing I will tell you is these are estimates because we would hope that with economic activity, the water use should go up. We should get more vitality, we should have more things going on. But we've used that information as a starting point. The other thing I wanna say, and it bears repeating, and I know the supervisor said this, only the properties within the district pay the costs of the district. That is New York State law. It is very, very clear. There is not really an opportunity for anyone but those who are benefited by the project to pay for it. So if you live, you know, over on the east side of town, you're not paying for this project. Only the properties that are within the district pay for the, for, for the project. That being said, we have projected the annual user costs with the $5.25 million of grants in hand, assuming a 4% interest rate and 28 years of borrowing, which is a state program that, that the town has access to. We've projected the first year cost, which again, we said bidding and construction in 2022, so first year cost is out there, and I have a schedule that we'll go over in a minute. It's a number of years from now. For the average commercial property, is $8,900 a year, and for the average non-commercial property is $4,800 a year. That's quite a bit of money, and everyone recognizes that's quite a bit of money. A couple things to note. This is an average, so we literally took the 109, figured out who was commercial, who was non-commercial, we added up those numbers, divided, and came up with an average. There are some that are higher, and there are some that are lower. Um, we do have a document called a map planner report that is on file here in the town that will be posted to the town's website once the town adopts that document. And in that document, there's a table, table one. Table one lists all 109 properties identified by their section block and lot and the owner, the street address, and it describes what the projected annual user cost is for each. So if you're a property owner and you want to know what your projected annual cost is, um, once that webs that's up on the website, you can go to table one, find your property, um, whatever name it's under, find the street address, and it will tell you what the projected annual debt service and the projected annual sewer rent cost for operation and maintenance is. At the bottom, we have another set of numbers. And this is our aspirational set of numbers. Um, after the district is formed, the town will have the opportunity to go pursue additional grants and low-cost financing that can't be ev evaluated or looked at or approached until after a district is formed. There's just rules. You want to use someone else's money, you have to follow the rules. So through something called the State Environmental Facilities Corporation, through the State Revolving Fund, low-cost financing is offered for water and sewer projects. Um, this being a sewer project, this project qualifies for that low-cost financing. So the top number, you know, that 8,900 and the 4,800, we assumed a 4% interest rate, which would be like akin to going out and getting a bond. Um, we're probably a little conservative, meaning we're giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt of what that interest rate would be, because remember, it's out in the future. We look at interest rates today, but it's out in the future. Um, that bottom set of numbers assumes a 2% interest rate which would be considered a subsidized interest rate under that program, that state revolving fund program, as well as an additional 25% grant through something called the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act. Um, the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act was created originally in 2015 and reauthorized in 2017 by the state of New York. It offers 25% grants for wastewater projects, up to $5 million in grant funds. And then there's a drinking water component to it as well. Um, once this district was to be formed, the town would apply for both of those, that low-cost financing as well as that grant. The bottom two numbers show you the effect that having low-cost financing and an additional 25% grant do on the rates. For the average commercial property, the, pro the project cost drops from $8,900 a year to $5,300 a year. So it's a pretty substantial change. For the non-commercial property, on average, it drops from 4,800 to 2,800. And again, most of that, while there's a grant involved there, a lot of it has to do with the interest rate. The interest rate of borrowing over 28 years makes a big difference. So, so that's a potential. 
the board can't consider those potentials, but we can certainly explain that that's a potential, and it's it's something that's very realistic for the town to to um, attempt to secure. So timeline. Here we are, February twenty fourth, twenty twenty. Map plan and report, that's that document I just talked about that has table one in it, that has a list of all of the properties with the projected costs. Um, and it also describes what we talked about before with how many linear feet of pipe and all of those good things. Um, that's today. Assuming that the town board decides that they want to adopt that map plan and report and um, schedule a public hearing, that hearing could be scheduled for March 9th, and that's that top number in the next arrow box. And then um, there's a proceeding that the town board has to conduct after that March 9th hearing, um, where they're basically saying, okay, we've had this map plan and report, it's identified all of the costs and all of the procedural things that need to go with this, we've conducted a public hearing, and now um, we're going to say that we want to consider, continue to consider this district, and that vote would be on April 6th. That would then kick off and schedule a referendum vote, which would happen on June 16th in this schedule, if all continues forward. Um, and, uh, and the next slide kind of talks a little bit about that, that vote, but that is a vote of the property owners of the district. It's a yes or, up or down, yes or no vote. Um, if that vote is positive, meaning, yes, we want to go forward with this district, then um, this proceeding has to go through a review at the Office of the State Comptroller. And that's because it's, it's costly, as we just outlined. It's an expensive project. So the Office of the State Comptroller conducts a review to verify that the project is legitimate in its scope that um, all the proceedings that are supposed to have been done have been done, proper notice has been given, vote was conducted, all of those kinds of nice things. That process takes a number of months. Um, the district is not considered formed until the Office of the State Comptroller signs off on the proceeding, and then um, that the district is filed with the county. Sewer districts are essentially taxing jurisdictions, so that's what this pro process is about. Thereafter, we would conduct financing. We're going to go for those grants and that low-cost financing. We have to design and permit this project, which is a pretty substantial project. That's going to take us some time to do. We'll end up with a giant roll of construction plans, a giant roll of specifications, a giant book of specifications, and this project will be subject to public bidding. Um, you guys are very lucky. You live in an area where you have excellent local contractors, and this type of project is something that um, we have many local contractors that can take on. For people who are interested, we said the cost was around $21 million. Roughly half of that cost is the cost of the pipelines and the infrastructure out in the community. The other half is the cost of the wastewater treatment plant. Generally speaking, you have contractors that specialize in things. We have pipeline people and we have treatment plant people. You have a number of contractors in the region that are very good and these, that $10 million project range for them is very reasonable. Um, thereafter, we're talking about bidding the project in 2022, late 2022 or early 2023, and about a two-year construction schedule. So we're all the way out to 2024. Um, 2024 seems like a long time from now. It's about four years from now. This would be a pretty quick process. This is a big project. So here's that information about the vote. It's targeted for June 16th. Voting is conducted the same way that an election is held, and um, the town attorney can address that in more detail um, if necessary. It's a simple majority vote of the total number of votes needed, so it's how many ever people show up. You know, it's, it's, it's a majority vote. Um, this is the part that's a little different, perhaps. And this comes right out of state law. The town had nothing to do with this. This is state statute. A single owner of a single property is one vote. A partnership who owns a property, regardless of the numbers of members in the partnership, is one vote. A limited liability corporation, regardless of the number of members, is also one vote. Corporations are just one vote. And owners, the last one's the tough one, owners of more than one property in the district only get one vote. Um, again, the town had nothing to do with this, and I had nothing to do with this. This is state law. Um, 
So that's the way this works out. When you look at Table 1 in the Map Planner Report, the very last column on the right-hand side identifies the voters. And it will also note where there was um, a property where it's the same owner for multiple properties. It'll say already listed, meaning that that, that property, and we just, you know, we went down the list. We didn't pick a particular property to represent a particular owner. But that, that means that that property is owned by someone who owns multiple properties in the district. Um, so this is the end of my little chat here. A um, couple of important dates. That public hearing on March 9th, assuming that the board adopts the map planner report tonight and resolves to schedule the hearing. The town board meeting on April 6th, when the town will take an action to state um, whether or not they want to proceed with the district and schedule the referendum. And um, that referendum, the scheduling of the referendum would occur on that, at that meeting on April 6th by, by resolution of the board. And then that referendum vote is targeted for June 16th. And again, um, those of you who have been here before are familiar with hpdowntown.com. Um, there's a bunch of information in there, but if you go to the wastewater tab right now, it's the older information from last. We were here almost exactly a year ago, um, but after the board's vote, it will be updated to incorporate the new information with that new map plan and report and the new information on the cost of the project. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Mary Beth. You. Such a great synopsis. Um, just a couple things I would like to mention before we open up uh, the meeting for questions. Uh, and again, um, Mary Beth mentioned the public hearing will be March 9th, and at that time you, you'll be um, able to uh, make a statement regarding your opinion on, on the project, and, and we welcome that. Um, but I just did want to uh, make a few uh, comments regarding additional funding sources. Um, and as uh, Mary Beth explained, we, we can't use the any potential funding sources when we uh, create the map plan and, and report. We can only uh, uh, you identify what the funding is that we've secured. So, um, you know, in the uh, last year or so, we've been applied to several other additional grant sources, and we do have Senator Schumer's aid here tonight. Uh, they're interested in Thank you for coming. We appreciate that. And, uh, you know, we, we have applied to the EDA for uh, done the pre-application process. Um, and uh, we've had some feedback on that. And we do hope that the senator can um, uh, identify some possible other um, funding streams. But, you know, we did have uh, some success with the EDA. We were able, they accepted our pre-application, which it's, you know these different these different grants use different um, application processes, and with the EDA, you actually have to be accepted at every step along the way. So um, we we were accepted for the pre-application process, but the stumbling block became uh, they would like they need a specific project with a specific number of jobs in order to um, actually fund us. So uh, you know, I, at that time, I reached out to a number of property owners and said, hey, you know, I know um, that people have really been uh, <coughs> pining for greater development and for the sewer district can you come on up with the project and identify 10 jobs or so because really that was the thresholds that they identified um, that we would need to meet to really kind of secure this funding so um, you know I didn't really hear back from anyone so uh, we just kind of have put that on hold hoping that yet when we have uh, further details and that the map plan report gets adopted that people will really believe in this that this project is happening and I think that there may be some skepticism uh, regarding that because the town really has been looking for to create a sewer district for probably about 50 years and you know the hard part that the problems that are hard to solve there's a reason right and and you know the town has been built out that is uh, so have finding a way a place to situate the infrastructure it's not easy it's if it's if it was vacant land it would be a very different process but because the town is really built out not fully built out not built out to its potential but there's a lot of roads there's a lot of homes so that makes location of of the infrastructure difficult um, but it's also because there's a lack of confidence in this vision that we'll be able to uh, bring it to fruition and I think that that is changing I, we're seeing a lot of development uh, 
major development uh, investments in, in the town uh, between the Saki manufacturing plant at the former Stop and Shop, which is about a, a $40 million project, uh, as well as Belfield, um, probably uh, somewhere around the same price for, for just the inn, uh, and there's much more potential there. So I think that when uh, people, the investors, the property owners see this potential and, and believe in this vision, then, then you know, they can make that leap of faith because looking at those numbers, those are hard numbers to get your mind around with the existing use of your property, right? But that's not what this is really for. Although, you know, I think we all realize that uh, if we have so many commercial uses on septic, there probably is infiltration into the ground from the from these operations, right? I think we're all aware of that. So uh, uh, we do, in addition to expecting the, uh, the uh, potential to be realized, we are solving some underlying prob problems where our commercial entities are using septic. So um, I think that, you know, it's, it's partially the, the hard numbers as well as this belief and this vision that, hey, I do have this way I can re reutilize my property uh, for a higher and better use. So, um, you know, I, I think part of that is I do look forward to working closely with property owners uh, where we can really hone a project. Uh, the town has had great success in obtaining grant funding. Uh, as as we've said, 5.25 for this, uh, several million from TAP, um, probably a couple million uh, additional from the county and some other sources. So, uh, you know, we, we I, as a community, if we really buy into this vision, we want this for our town, it's gonna hurt a little bit. I mean, these, these infrastructure projects are not for free. So that is, you know, what we felt charged with as the town board is like, let's really dig into this process. Let's see what we can do to, to come up with a viable, realistic plan. And I think that we've done that. So again, we're, we, we, we're hopeful on the EDA that uh, we can push this <coughs> forward and with some of our partners at the federal level find some additional funding sources. And with our partners in, at the local level, come up with a project that we can really get excited about and uh, our partners could as well. And then we also have a million dollar application into the program for manageable growth with the county and I see we have our two county legislators here tonight so glad to see you both here. Um, and uh, uh, that's for a million dollars so uh, we've had a lot of support from the county. We worked work very closely with Ron Hicks and he's been a great supporter of this project as well as the Water Authority. So um, those are still potential uh, funding sources that can bring those numbers down. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and open up the, and Emily, and, and, and actually we have uh, our downtown initiative coordinator, Emily Svensson here. So yeah, please add uh, Emily. And Emily was on the board for years and wrote most of the grants that we talked about. So please do add. I just wanted to add to, to what the supervisor said. So where we're at right now is five and a quarter million. We have an application in for a million from the county, which you know we could get some or all of that. Um, might still be able to get EDA funding. And then the other funding source that I think Mary Beth mentioned that's still out there is the New York State Water Infrastructure Grants. The problem with those is you can't even apply for them until you've formed a district. And the application period is coming up again this summer. So the reason that we're proceeding with this at this time is that if we can get the district formed, we'll be ready in time for hopefully this cycle of the water infrastructure grants, which could be up to 25% of the remaining unfunded amount. So all, all those potential funding sources could, I mean, we might not get any of them, but we might get some of them, and that would bring the cost down. So what we're looking at now is really a worst case scenario with the cost. Thanks, Emily, sure. good points. Okay, so um, uh, please feel free to ask your questions, and um, would you like to either can stay in your seat or go to the podium, however, however you prefer? Yeah, you know, actually, if you don't mind, if you could join us at the podium, it will enable people at home to uh, to be able to hear your questions and um, to make the issues very clear. Oh, 
<laughs> yeah, and you know, um, uh, we typically set the timer for three minutes. That's so fine. I mean, that's I'm just beginning uh, to evaluate what's going sure, on, so course. I don't know. Yep. And, and yeah, feel free to ask questions. And okay. during the public hearing, it will be a more formal process, and people will make their statements. But we're, you know, <laughs> we're having a. This um, more informal session and giving everybody the ability to ask questions and just be mindful that there are other people in the audience that may also want to uh, to ask questions. So, hi. Um, I mean, I commend you for wanting to do this project. I support the project. I think the grants that you have obtained have been excellent, and I want to support that movement. I have a lot of concerns about the property owners that are currently working, uh, operating businesses, and have been for decades here, um, taking on a lot of this burden for someone else to come in and, and have a benefit from it. Um, how difficult was the site choice? I live on 10 Hudson Drive. I do not want this where it's going to go. So can you explain to us a little bit about what the other locations were, what the limitations were? Was it financial? Because this piece of property in particular has quite a bit of history to it, and you're bypassing quite a bit in terms of the church ownership and the Roosevelt handing this to the churches that it was intended to stay as a public park. And you can say that the building is going to be pretty, and that's great, but it's going to be an incredible impact to where I live, to the corridor, East Market Street. The in, the, both the intersections to get to East Market Street, to get to this site, are incredible. It's the, one of the worst turns. So to get even the construction equipment in there is going to be an incredible burden. So I just want to know what the other sites were, I guess, would be okay. where you could start. Sure. sure. And, and Mary Beth can speak to that, and I'll just speak to one. Um, but, you know, Pinewoods does have access through Pinewoods Road, and I'm imagining that we will be able, you know, we haven't designed exactly that part yet, but it wouldn't, uh, there is access to this site from Pinewoods Road. So not well, there's existing trail through there now. I mean, we haven't really honed in on that part yet, but. Yeah. Um, well, there, there, so there is rock. Um, there may or may not be blasting. I will tell you um, just really quickly on that. Blasting goes boom and it's done. If we bring a hoe ram in there, you guys have gone by these on the throughway. Bam, 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 bam for three, four, five weeks, shaking everything. So people are afraid of blasting. I'm kind of like on the whole do it once, get it over with, and be done with it, as opposed to other kinds of mechanical means of removing rock, which are very invasive, really dusty, really noisy for a long period of time. So, two sites. Um, we looked at, let me see if I can make my little pointer thing work. No, I don't think it's going to work. Um, we looked at numerous sites in this corridor. And one of the things that we have to think about when we're looking at where we're going to put a waste water treatment plant is how far away from all of the things that we're going to try to sewer is it going to be because we have to pay for the cost of the pipe to get it there. That's one of the considerations. We also have to have a place where the water can go, right? We're, we're going to discharge, in this case, up to 103,000 gallons of water a day. We looked at numerous sites here where our very first charge was to look to see if there was a way to put this in the ground, not have it be a stream dis discharge, excuse me. We looked at numerous sites. Folks are probably familiar with the fact that on the east side of Route 9, it's very rocky. On the west side of New Route 9, it's rather sandy. So we looked at a number of different sites. We looked at, um, we started out with geology. We looked at the geology. We looked at the likely area of land that would be needed. We narrowed down to say, okay, where is there land that could potentially fit that criteria? We identified a couple of sites. We started looking at, okay, what is the ownership? What is the zoning? What is the practicality of doing a subsurface discharge? And we ended up determining that um, while it could be done, it would be a very limited system, not nearly as large as the systems that we're talking about, a very, very small system just because of geology and space. So that was kind of one level of review. Another level of review was to say, okay, where does the town own land? Where is public land? This is a commercial corridor. We don't want to take commercial, productive commercial land, people's private property, out of their hands if we can avoid that. So we looked at where are their public lands. Well, down at the south end of the corridor, there's actually a lot of public lands. But it's a lot of public lands that's highly restricted, right? It's lands that are owned by the National Park Service, Scenic Hudson. There are other kinds of restrictions on land in this general area. So that presents a barrier. We looked at where are there other town-owned lands. We 
are standing on a site that is town-owned land. We evaluated this site to see if what kind of space, what kind of geology, what are the things that we're looking at on this site. Pinewoods Park is owned by the town. We did look at that site. Obviously, it's owned by the town. We looked at a number of different things. We also then, our next tier was to look at commercial sites, places that people own along here that are privately owned but that are for sale. There are a number of them. It's not surprising you drive up and down the street, you see a lot of for sale signs. We looked at probably five or six that met basic criteria in terms of size and space requirements. We do need a couple of acres of land. It, it's, this is, these are not postage stamps, this is, it's a couple of acres of land. Um, the other thing we looked at was we said, you know, in a perfect world, you don't want to put this right on Route 9. You know, I mean, while we can make it look like kind of anything, you're still taking really valuable real estate that could contribute to the community and contribute to this project off the books. So we looked at that. We identified a number of different potential sites. Some of them were very, very challenging. They're very close to little streams. There's a regulation that says we have to be a certain distance away from a stream with a wastewater treatment plant. Some of them were just configured really, really in a really challenging way in terms of the layout of the properties. Um, there were some that looked pretty good. So with the town, we talked to some of the property owners. And as you said, you know, they're saying, wait a minute, I own commercial property. I want to develop my property for commercial purposes. I don't want to develop it for a wastewater treatment plant, even though, you know, they would be paid and those kinds of things. So we did a really extensive process. And if we were here probably a dozen times, um, going over all of that in great detail, um, looking at many, many different sites. Um, again, it's, um, this is a challenging, challenging corridor to sewer. As a supervisor said, um, this is, pro to, my, to my knowledge, um, at least this is, I think, the third one that I'm very personally aware of going to try to evaluate what to do here. Um, this is a challenging, challenging location. Um, would it be nice to not have it in a park? Yes. But the other thing to know is that um, I think there's this vision that there's going to be a giant building you're going to be able to see from everywhere. That's not the case. This will not be clear cut. There will still be trees here. There's a lot of relief. There's a lot of land lower. There's a lot of land higher. Will it be completely invisible? No, that's not realistic. But it, um, there's no idea to clear cut. There's no idea to um, have this be, you know, bold and sticking out and looking super industrial. That's not in keeping with the park. So yes, it's a structure in a park, absolutely. You know, we can't get around that, but that is the intention. So there was a tremendous amount of effort, and I don't know if you want to expand on this anymore, but there was a tremendous amount of effort looking at sites, looking at options, looking at the scale. Could we make it smaller to reduce where the building could go? There are all of those different kinds of considerations um, taken into, into account. Um, I, I can't really expand on that too much, Mary Beth, but yeah, I, even in 2012, uh, one of the first, when we first took office, one of the first things that we did is uh, went to Sina Cutson, who um, owned the Morgan property, uh, which is just north of the FDR home, and we're like, what a perfect place for uh, this subsurface discharge. So we went multiple times and said, hey, can we, you know, and they, they were not able to because they had uh, easements on the property which prohibited it. And we did call several property owners, um, again, as Mary Beth mentioned, in the southern part of town and said, hey, what do you think, you know, maybe we could use the, just the rear portion of your property and they were not interested in that. And, you know, to the, and, and as part of the project, part of the project cost, uh, putting it in the park makes sense from, from that perspective, and certainly I do understand your perspective, um, that it makes sense because the town owns it. Um, otherwise, we'd be buying the property, uh, the district would be having to purchase it from, uh, from uh, a property owner. So, you know, there was that incentive. Um, and, you know, I spent a lot of time in Pinewoods Park. Um, you know, I grew up here. My kids, we played tennis up there, you know, went to the stream, walked the trails. And uh, one of the, you know, issues of Pine Woods is that it's isolated. Mm -hmm. You know, we get a lot of fe recent feedback from mothers and different people who go to the park, and they're like, ah, you know, I'm not that comfortable there because there's no activity, uh, especially in the daytime. So, you know, as just an, um, you know, an aside or an adjunct, 
thought. It's at least it will it will provide some additional activity in the park because it is kind of quiet. It's very isolated. So you know, for all those reasons, um, it does seem like a good location. But again, I of course understand your concern, and that's why you know I did ask Mary Beth to make sure that she brought the images of the existing plants that are are constructed elsewhere and so um, you know we have had at least four public meetings over the last year one of them was with the um, East Market Street folks uh, because we had at one time considered and asked if they would like to be part of this district and we had a good meeting it was you know very um, well attended because when it's a neighborhood people are uh, more much more engaged and um, you know I they made some very good points and I just want to speak to the one point that you brought up about the church uh, and you know we've researched that quite extensively so um, we're just kind of catching our attorney mm -hmm. cold here but he did research it and do you do you ha are you able to yeah. speak to that a little bit yeah um, I I don't remember the name of the church that donated the property, but we did examine the deeds to the property uh, from, from the church to the town. There was an argument made by an attorney. I don't know whether he was uh, hired, retained by the church or not, but he may have represented some property owners, uh, that there was a prohibition in the deed on, on using this for other than park purposes. And, and the actual wording in the deed, it's, it permits it to be used for uh, a park uh, or other public purposes. And um, the question arose as to whether um, a district which serves a portion of the town, not the entire town, uh, would be deemed to be a public purpose. And there's decisional law to the effect that, yes, that would be a, a valid public purpose. So there's no prohibition uh, of the deed from the uh, church to the town. Um, it, 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 it is considered what we call alienation of parkland. Um, so um, in order for us to do this, and we're not doing it now until the district is formed, we will have to uh, obtain legislation uh, from, uh, from the state, uh, special legislation to allow us to utilize that parkland for this purpose. And that will have to be approved by a, a special act which, uh, of, uh, of the legislature. And we are also required as, as part of that prox process to donate back to the park um, a comparable property or a contribution in kind. I think we're, we're going to be contributing, is it four acres? Is, is that the? I think oh, it's two. It's not two acres. I, think it's I don't two. remember the exact, yeah, maybe yeah, it was two, two. acre. Mm -hmm. uh, comparable size parcel that we, the town owns adjacent to that, that will become part of the park. And it could be required that we may have to uh, fund an additional amount of money as part of the alienation of parkland to compensate, but we, we did research carefully the issues with regard to the church, and we feel there's no legal prohibition in utilizing that property. Why about the site? Why I, the I can't hear you. Uh, would yet. you mind coming? Why which mind this end of the site? Why uh, the site of the park? Why not further in towards Pinewoods So, so um, this is the least destructive place to put a wastewater treatment plant. The further in we go, the more disturbance there is, the more cost, and the more destructive it is. The green line, and I don't know if folks can see it, you can come look at it after, is the existing trail network. We felt it was really important to maintain that trail network. It's where people go, people are comfortable there. We didn't want to disrupt it. This um, portion of the, pro of the property did not impact that trail network. And that was an important consideration. Um, coming further in, there's more rock, there's more relief. Um, it would be much more expensive and again, much more disruptive. This is, this is very, you know, it's intended to be very limited in terms of its impact. Okay, would, yeah, Perry? Oh. Oh. <coughs> Hi. How you guys do? How you guys doing? Travis Trainer. I own uh, 38 East Market Street, which is 300 feet from where the plant site is uh, intended to be. A uh, couple questions. Um, well, first things off. Um, if that plant is built there, those trails are all useless at that point because they'll all lead back to the building that nobody will want to go to. Also, it will get graffitied because the trees right next to that spot. Today I was there. 
uh, are graffitied. So that's also something you got to take in consideration. But um, uh, first off, I don't want the uh, plant there because it's right next to my house. Now I'm, you know, we. I heard the uh, there's only going to be a truck once a month. You know, um, what the, there's just people going there from I, I forget you said seven to four or something. Yeah, every day. But then I have to live next to that every day. So what like, is it? Just like oh, like no one cares. You know, it's just one person who cares about what their opinion is or. You know, because I, I have uh, my child of my own, and, she, you know, she loves that park. So, and that's part of the reason I bought the house. I bought it two years ago with no idea that this plan was even, you know, a, a thought. So, I mean, d is there anything for me, or is it just, you know, who cares? Well, uh, you know, we're doing the information sessions, and, um, you know, it's it's very hard to answer that question, but... Ultimately, this decision is going to be made by the 109 property owners, okay? And uh, those are the people that own the, own the property within the district. So that's who's going to make the decision on this, um, and that will be via this vote. I understand. Uh, I came here for the vote for on East Market Street, and uh, I know once the letter was sent out, we... Uh, a lot of us said no, so that's why we're not included in this. Uh, am I still going to have to pay the tax to have the pipe go through my? No. Okay, no? no. Okay, I was just no, wondering about that. Not. Okay. No, no. and, and like, as, like we agreed, um, we did have the meeting. We offered this to the East Market people, and the consensus that was that they prefer not to be part of the district. So, no, you wouldn't be part of it. You wouldn't have to pay for it. Okay. Okay, so I just have to live next to it. Okay, all right. Thank you. That's all I got. Thanks. Thanks. Right. Let me just quickly add that um, the site would be fenced to prevent entry, and we're pretty good at fences. So I no, I, find I people I, can't generally climb over them and graffiti them. Frankly, we don't find people graffiti these buildings. Like this is a this is a pump station. This little guy, it's right. There's a walking trail right behind here. You can't see that. It's been, that's been there for 10 years, no graffiti. And it's not in a particularly, I mean, this, there's a road out here, but it's not, because it looks so nice. People don't generally graffiti things that look really nice. If something looks really industrial like that, people will spray paint the generator for sure. But we haven't seen that with these nicer looking facilities. That's one of the reasons to make them nicer, just no, so you know. No, that makes a lot of sense. The old water plant that's on the same road that gets graffitied all the time. So, you know, you can build a fence, you know, you can build a 10 foot fence. People, you know, will come with a bigger ladder and come graffiti it. No, th also everyone should know it's CCTV. So if you do it, we'll catch you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that was it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you Trevor. You. The uh, Belfield property, the sewer plant being built there, is that not a modular? Uh, sewer plant that can be added on to for future it, it is absolutely um, at a cost and that cost was provided to the town um, also it gets a little complicated so the town we mentioned has all those grants and we're talking about a sewer a taxing jurisdiction where the taxpayers are going to pay for something a service the town's going to provide one of the things we can't do is we can't use those grants to benefit a private entity. So we couldn't just give that money to Bellafield to build the treatment plant. We couldn't just directly give tax dollars to Bellafield to build a bigger plant. So you need an arrangement where they're building it and then providing a service back to the town. And because of that, um, you know, they have their cost of money they have their and their commercial business. So we were talking about borrowing rates for the town of two, four percent, those kinds of things. Commercial borrowing rates are significantly higher. So um, that's one of the factors that comes into play. Um, the other thing is, you know, Bellafield um, is looking to grow themselves, and they it is modular, and they can add on to it. But it's a process, and so they offer it, I believe, thirty thousand gallons a day. 
um, which again would meet the current needs of the district but wouldn't provide for anything in the future and that was a consideration given the the the, fi the money and the fact that the grants that were received to date couldn't be used um, that I think the, the board took into consideration yeah uh, and the other issue is the well, the dead pipe to go there because um, uh, Mary Beth mentioned earlier one of the con the limitations is that any public entity does not have to pay for the district. So we would have to run the pipe through the National Park Service, uh, through the, um, the library, and they don't have to contribute. So you're talking about a very long ex and very expensive pipe mm -hmm. that they don't pay into. So when you add that up and into the mix for what we would they would charge us to accept our sewage, <coughs> And that the reality that the grant funding that we have uh, secured based on the description of this district that for all those reasons it won't end up being cost-effective thank you okay hey good evening Hi, Perry. Perry Sheldon. I'm here as uh, representing the Board of Education and first of all, thank you for all of your efforts to, toward this investment in our community. A couple questions just for, from a clarification standpoint, and I think I've got the answer. So it sounds like the current flow is approximately 30,000 30, gallons. Yes. And yeah. we're anticipating uh, the design is for a 103 capacity. So you've got about a threefold fold uh, um, in, uh, development or uh, expansion. Um, and, and I'm not well versed in sewer treatment plants, so is the 103 capacity based on plant size or collection system or both so what we did was we looked at this geography that's here that's inside the yellow the district and we evaluated the various potential land uses so we looked at for the 30,000 gallons that's what's there today that's an estimate of what's there today. We then said, given the town's zoning, given um, the, the land area that's available, taking out things like parking lots and roads and the fact that you can't build right up to your property, we said, what is, because this is our job, what is the most intense land use from a water perspective that could be built here? What's that build out look like? Including, say, multi-story buildings that could be hotels, those kinds of things. We did an analysis of that, and that's where we developed the 103,000 gallons a day. Um, and that's in um, one of the reports that's on the town's website. Again, it's sort of visionary. One of the things that happens with these plants, and the gentleman brought up modular facilities, and there are modular facilities. One of the challenges is as we add modules, the cost per gallon goes up. There's a lot of economy of scale, and that was what we were looking for here. Remember we said we had kind of had the three districts and we got the Goldilocks one and the one in the middle? The problem with the little one was that the cost of the treatment plant was so expensive, even to treat the little one, it just wasn't, wasn't reasonable. And that one, I think, was around 50 or 60,000 gallons a day. And then we had an enormous one that was even bigger, and that one was also not reasonable. So it's a, ba it's a balancing, but the 103,000 gallons a day is based on the idea that you would build a treatment plant here for this collection system. You build the whole thing all at one time, and that that would encourage growth and development and investment in that area, and that um, as envisioned, again, sort of the most intense land uses currently envisioned by the town um, and through a lot of public um, information and those kinds of things, could equate to approximately 103,000 gallons a day of wastewater. Okay. So in the costs that are projected, the annual cost, um, obviously school district is uh, very concerned about costs and operational costs. Um, is there any provisions made? And we have religious organizations that are also property, property owners in the district. Uh, is there any consideration uh, for those? Are they treated in the same way as far as cost goes? They're treated in the same way. I mean, yeah. they're based on the formula. Right, that right. So it's based on the okay. Although there were two, we did have two formulas. Okay. We had the commercial formula yeah. and the non-commercial formula. Okay. So the commercial formula, folks who have the commercial formula do pay a little bit more. Mm -hmm. The idea being that they're making money on the deal, right? Okay. They're for profit. 
entities. So the provision of a public service is allowing them to be more profitable, those kinds of things. So we do have, and that's why you saw there were those two right. categories. There was the commercial and the non-commercial. So the school district, the churches, those folks are all in the non-commercial. And that's one of the reasons why you see that the cost difference is, is, is fairly significant. Okay. And construction on the time frame or the timeline that you've established, we're looking at construction through 2024, I believe. Correct. When would the first cost be incurred by the school district? Mm -hmm. So the way that that works, um, wastewater, the, the infrastructure of this nature is obviously really expensive. And all the contractors have to be paid as they go along. Every month they submit a bill and say, I want to be paid for what I did. So the way these projects work is the town will finance on a short-term basis, one way or another, the costs of, con of the entire project. So the whole thing, with the exception of any grants that act as cash, that can be used to pay costs as we go along. Some of these grants act as principal forgiveness. They come off the borrowing at the end. So the town will finance all of that through some kind of a short-term borrowing. The state short-term borrowing program is a pretty good deal. It offers right now, it offers for a project of this nature with the access to finance that we currently have, it would provide 50% of the cost of the project during construction, so a bridge loan at 0% interest, and 50% at a very low interest rate. Right now, that low interest rate is about 0.78%, so less than 1%. It's a pretty good deal. During that period, which is up to five years, the town makes very nominal payments, and those payments are based on the amount of money drawn to date. So it acts like a line of credit, essentially. Rather than if people are familiar with bond anticipation notes, you take out the note, it hits your bank account, you start paying interest the day you get it. These programs act like lines of credit, saves you money on interest. So the actual tax bills, there's a couple of different ways it can be done. But at the end of construction, one of the things that's our job is to certify that the project was completed as it was approved by the state, because the Department of Environmental Conservation makes sure we build what we say we're going to build, um, and that the costs are all what they were outlined to be, because this is public. So it's all available to the public. Everybody can see every penny that was spent. Um, once that process is done, then that short-term financing, which is like a bridge loan, gets rolled into long-term financing, and debt service payments start. Now, they start, meaning you have to have the money available to pay for it when the bill comes. So it's not uncommon that the community will have to figure out, okay, as we're approaching that date where construction is going to be concluded and long-term financing is going to come into play, how will that first year debt payment work? Long and short of it is um, generally those costs, you're looking at costs of bill not earlier than 2023 on this schedule, probably more like 2024. Again, this is sort of a, okay. you know, visionary schedule at this point, but it's not tomorrow. And that's important so that people can plan because is planning is important. Is the bridge loan, is, the bridge loan um, is a nominal, so the first half of it's no interest, so it's a nominal principal payment. The second half of it's also a nominal principal payment. It's based on the amount of money drawn in the year prior to a magic date. It ends up being, I mean, this we're looking at a $21 million project. Those costs generally end up being $20,000, $30,000 a year. They're, it's, it's, we all should have access to such wonderful financing. Yeah, it's let a great us know program. how the district can get a hold of that. <laughs> 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 um, and one last question, it's more of a curiosity or anything. I, I see the, the mains and they seem to meander through uh, many private uh, properties and not down Route 9, which would have been my logical point, but I understand the issues of, of digging up Route 9 and the, uh, are there any other reasons as to why Route 9 wasn't used as the primary artery for those mains? So um, there's a couple of different reasons. So Route, route 9, as you know, is the historic road. So digging there and putting a sewer through there for many reasons would be unbelievably expensive. We have the cultural resource issue. We have the fact that there's probably other stuff under there that none of us know about, and there's no way for us to know about because someone put it there in 17, you know, 90. Um, so very expensive, unbelievably disruptive. Like, you guys all know what happens out here in the summertime, and you can't get between the lights and stuff. Now imagine construction, because when does construction happen? 
in the summertime. So it would be incredibly disruptive, very, very expensive. The other thing to think about is by not putting on a Route 9, so there's just the cost of putting on a Route 9, but by not putting on a Route 9 and putting it um, through properties, you're actually saving property owners money. Because right now, all of those properties have a septic system of some kind, some kind of little treatment system on their site. Some place in the building, there's a pipe that goes out to hopefully a septic tank and a leach field, <laughs> hopefully. Um, the property owner is going to be responsible to do, quote, the plumbing part, right, to connect, to disable that on-site system and connect to it. If we put the sewers in the road, you have to redo all your building plumbing. And you have to build out under the sidewalks, the brand new, beautiful, gorgeous sidewalks. And you're in the storm drain system. And by the way, you're dealing with our friends at DOT. Hmm. Have fun with that. So um, that's the reason why. This is the most efficient way to do it, is the lowest cost way to do it, and is the least disruptive way to do it. So. Again, thank you. And thank, thank by the way, thank you for the sidewalks okay. and the lighting. It's uh, great thanks, Barry. Thank we you. appreciate that. <coughs> Hi, I'm Sarah Hoger. Hi, How are you doing? Um, also, thank you for the sidewalks and the plumbing uh, and the lighting. It's beautiful. And thank you for everything you've been doing the last few years. It really has made a difference. Um, as you know, I'm a strong supporter of Hyde Park, and hopefully some of the things I've done in the past have made a difference, too. Um, you've been doing an excellent job here, Mary Beth. It looks like you've memorized more information than I, I don't even know how you did it. <coughs> but uh, just a couple of questions as I understand the sure. process here. Um, I'm not exactly sure I'm convinced yet that this is the most realistic uh, location. And just sticking with the park for a moment, uh, there are people that use the park like myself, um, and I don't care that there's not a million other people there. But like the baseball field, for example, on the other side of the park, um, does not get, uh, as a person who uses the park with a lot of frequency, there's not a lot of usage of the baseball field, which is on the other opposite side. So what's the thought about not using the baseball field? Well, I think the proximity to the water is much further there, right? I mean, they, that, that's the advantage to the location that we selected. It's the plant can be built very close to the discharge point, which is the crumb elbow. But so your thought is that the baseball field, you know, I don't know how far that is from the, uh, w where the discharge point would go from there. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good distance, and um, it's through rock, which is expensive. <laughs> but um, You're going to have to blast no matter what, probably. Y you may, and again, I'm back to um, and, uh, having been on a lot of construction sites. If anybody wants to go see a hoe ram in action, I'll bring you in. You might, might like the one time it blasts, and then you're done. Um, the, uh, but again, just to be clear, like many of us have already lived through blasting, we totally get it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. But it might be worth that to reconsider. Yeah. It's already a bigger kind of area mm -hmm. um, for those people who believe it won't have a lot of graffiti on it. I'm not sure that's the case. You, you know what I'm talking yes. about. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is um, not that I want to use it as drinking water. Okay. <laughs> But you said essentially drinking water. What exactly does that mean? Yeah, so um, the membrane bioreactor technology that's being used is um, it, it's literally a membrane. So in drinking water plants, membranes are used to keep all of the bad stuff on the one side of the membrane. There's a vacuum that pulls the water through and the clean water comes out the other side. This is exactly the same thing. These plants are, they literally, in the New York City drinking watershed, we built 50 of these. We didn't actually use this technology because it didn't exist when we were building them. We were using gold fashioned sand filters um, and other types of membrane technologies. But this will, the standard that we're meeting in the crumb elbow is that we have to be able to keep fish alive and propagating as though there was no other water in the water body. So we have to be able to raise trout. So it's that clean, it's that clear. Um, in the engineering report, there's a description of the actual discharge standards that are anticipated, but they are the most dis stringent discharge standards that are available in the state. They're called intermittent stream affluent limits, I-S-E-L, affluent limits. Um, so it is very, very clean, it is disinfected. This, In this case, what's proposed here is UV light to disinfect the wastewater. Um, and so it's, it's a very, very, very clean, it's 
water. It doesn't have any color. It doesn't have any odor. Well, I hope water. it doesn't have color. No. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, on odor, okay. Um, I know I've heard you say that it doesn't have any odor. I, I actually have had different experience that, that sometimes there is odor, depending on the direction of the wind, depending on other conditions. So I, I believe that there will be, on occasion, not every day, but there will be odor. And so uh, from a property value standpoint, some of the more expensive houses in Hyde Park are actually right across the street. Have you done any kind of investigation on how the property values might have changed um, in other areas? In fact, we did. Um, we presented yeah. that information here many years ago. Um, this plant and this plant were both built in the same situation. All septic systems, all septic systems, brand new infrastructure. Um, this was about $16 million 11 or 12 years ago. This one was about $20 million, same time frame. Property values all went up, up, all went up. Because again, people can use their properties for more robust reasons. To the odor question, at a wastewater treatment plant, odor generated where the wastewater comes in and they're generated where the wastewater, we talked about the sludge, they're generated where the sludge is. In the proposed plant, just like in this plant, those are inside buildings with odor control. So there's, they're not outdoors. Um, now, if somebody opens a door, a roll-up door, it might smell for as long as the roll-up door is open. But generally speaking, um, these really don't, there isn't a continuous odor. Can I tell you that it smells like a bed of roses? No, it's a wastewater treatment plant. But do we use technology to avoid routine odors? Absolutely. And again, these plants, I'm showing you a bunch of pictures of them. There are a lot of them. I guarantee you, you've driven by them. You didn't even know it was a wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, just, uh, just to, again, kind of keeping with uh, the best I can tell, and the vision's fading a little bit as I get older. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, those seem like a little bit more flat areas. And where you're putting it right now, where you're proposed to put it, is off the side of a rolling hill, I believe, and in more of a valley. I believe you might have a slightly different experience in that physical location. No. Nope. No. No, inside a building with odor control. So there's no wind hitting the it. There's the, no. The truck is going to go in the building to get rid of the sludge? Yes. Yep. It's a liquid. It's just like when it's just, it's liquid. So they connect it and pump it into the tank and there's no air and off they go. All right. Hold on. One more thing. Uh, and this is the, um, uh, the public purpose. Um, I know that was just uh, thrown to you in the last second, but the, um, I just want to be uh, sensitive and I haven't had time to think about it. I'm sure you probably haven't had much time to think about it either. But is it really, you don't have to answer this right now, but considered public purpose if only 109 houses, uh, so that's part of the public. Is that really the intent there? Um, as you know, there's a lot of church kind of history in the in the area. and then. And then when you're taking a part of the public, um, the park, uh, to put the uh, facility in, but then you have to get, if you will, I think I heard you say, get rid of some of the other property to pay it off in kind. So you're taking property have, here. There was a piece of property that was donated to the town um, a number of years ago that was never connected to the park will be an addition to the No, park. not 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 the park property. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, it was I can't remember the name of the people it's right okay. now, but they didn't donated a piece of of land that is um, attaches to my Pinewoods Park. Uh, it was never incorporated into the park, but we would be that's what we would be doing because you have the ability to replace the land and, and therefore the so alienation. It's, it's not being used currently in the park. Nobody even knows it exists, but you guys, well, we all own well, it. Is that correct? Well, actually, you know, we did a little research project to see what town, what properties the town owns. Yep. And that was one that came up. And that was somewhat unrelated. I didn't really even know that. Surprise. Most people didn't know that. Um, and actually, we own a piece of property off of St. Andrews that we tried to market if anybody wanted. <laughs> we, had, we had it on the market. It's still for sale. But uh, so that is that is our plan. Uh, we identified that piece, and then we would attach that to the park. Yeah, thanks, and, I, and again, even though it's a statement, I think it's a great idea 
to be trying to build for the future. Yeah, well, thanks, Sarah. I Thank appreciate you. your, yes, your comments and your questions, for sure. Hi, Luigi. Hello, how are you? Okay. Um, this brings back memories of about 25 years ago when the water treatment plant was built in this town. Um, some of you remember, some of you don't, but it was a very bad time. A lot of people lost their land, a lot of people lost their businesses, there were a lot of enemies made, and so on. We just saw the cost increase of the treatment plant to by $3 million that we didn't know about. I read that uh, cost overruns are anywhere between 10 and 30 percent, which means that it's going to be even more. As it is, most of us can't afford what you're proposing. Please? Can, it, wait, just, can we just, I just want to make sure that we make it clear that we cannot exceed the map plan and report price. But, and but please I understand. continue. I just want to make I that, understand. That, we were, that, a that lot clear. of these things we were told back then also. Okay. And my father was worried that we were going to lose everything back then, and we came very close to losing everything. Right now, as proposed, I will lose everything. Everything my father did, I will not be able to afford this. How sure are you that you can actually save us money from this original price? Again, we were promised this 25 years ago. Oh, there's grants, there's this, oh, it's going to increase this, it's going to increase that. Nothing came to fruition, nothing. We still got water. There were other plans that weren't, weren't listened to. So how sure can you be that when a bunch of us say we can't pay, how are you going to pay for this thing? Because I am telling you right now, some of the other property owners are already told me they couldn't be here because they're away, that they will not be able to afford these payments. So what are you going to do? You're not in the restaurant business. <laughs> but that is, that is, it is your decision. It Good. Is the, it is, it is and it will be our decision. It is absolutely. Good. But that is the fair way. That is. It's look, not we, fair. 109 property owners is not fair. No, but you will like drive it. us out of business. Okay. Plain and simple. We will go out of business. And it will be on you. Plain and simple. I hope you enjoy the restaurant business. Again, it's uh, the it's the property owner's uh, decision. To be perfectly clear, the town feels like we've done our job. This is what we were charged with: is find create a sewer district. We need sewer. How many times have we heard that? How many times has the business community said it? At what price? I, I know, we're Luigi. I understand. I do. And and but again, the the vote, the the onus is on the property owners, and it's your decision. So, and I and I do empathize. So yeah, Charles. Hi, Hi Charles. Uh, just had a question sure. to pick your brain. Kind of, you said you've got clients all over the state. Is there a, another high park situation in another town over the last maybe ten years that has successfully pulled this off, where the property values have gone up, and uh, you know, I'm in the banking world. Um, thinking of property values, thinking of two years in, you want to sell your property. Is it more? Is it less? Does the burden of the next 26 years at that point decrease the property value? How does it impact the, I know it's a lot of questions, but how does it impact the uh, assessments? Because as a business in this town, we pay a lot of taxes. Those Route 9 ones, we really do. I mean, we're highly assessed. And how does it affect that in the, in, in you know, because if it goes up, you might assess us more and you're paying even more than, than you know, we have business that says, you know, I can't pay it, you know. Uh, can it get worse? If, the prop if, it, if it was a home run and property values go up, does that mean that there's a higher assessment? So. Those are difficult questions. Uh, that I, the assessment questions are really kind of out of Mary Beth's purview. Well, well, the value, but the value questions are not. I think she can really speak to that. I think the thing is, you know, access to public infrastructure from a development perspective is huge. We one of the things we did was we did look at the assessed value of the district. What's the total assessed value? Then we said, well, okay, that's for what's there today, and and you can see what's here today. Um, but what we saw in other communities was that properties that maybe were being utilized but weren't being utilized maybe 
as much as they could be were utilized more. And that generated economic activity, it generated more tax base, it generated more sales tax. And did some of the assessed values, people made improvements because now they had a reason to make an improvement to their property? So yeah, their assessments went up. But one of the things that happens when assessments go up, if you're familiar with how taxes are done, that, you know, there's a tax warrant, right? The amount of money the community, be it the town or the county or whoever needs to generate to run the place is divided by the assessed value of all the things that could possibly pay for it. As the assessed values go up, the cost to run it doesn't go up. The cost to run it stays relatively flat. So increasing assessed values generally reduces cost to each property for these projects because it's just simple math. Same thing with the rent, the sewer rent. The sewer rent is based on the number of gallons against the cost to run the plant. As the number of gallons go up, the cost to run the plant doesn't increase that much. It goes up a little tiny bit, but it's certainly not in relationship. So the cost per gallon goes down the more activity there is. That's what's so challenging about this, and that's the reason you don't have a sewer system. To, to the gentleman's point, there's only 109 properties. We looked at a system that was much larger, had many more properties. It was even more expensive because of all the other things you had to build. We looked at a system that was much smaller, and that was even more expensive because there were even fewer people to pay for a lot of things. So this is all about that relationship between the, the cost of providing the service and the things that can generate the revenue to pay for it. So as improvements happen, and that's the reason that this was not designed to just be a 30,000 gallon a day system, that would bury everybody. That's a tremendous limitation. It was designed to allow for investment. There's a lot of properties here that are underutilized or not utilized at all. There's a lot of places with signs in the window that say for rent. So getting people and getting activity and getting things in there not only helps reduce the cost of the project to each of the properties, but it also generates additional tax revenue. So I think really to speak to that point is that we're, uh, we're um, visioning a much more intensity on a number of larger projects, or properties in particular, which really those are the assessments that are going to go up, and that's how the benefit uh, accrues to the entire town because instead of having uh, 11 vacant acres uh, behind the Grand Union, you can have senior housing or 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 uh, you know millennial housing, artist housing, and m greater commercial activity. So really, we imagine that those in that intensity is going to drive up the tax base. And I think what your question, Charles, is the uh, CFO is at, at round out savings. So yeah. I think your particular question is: Will your because we're imagining that the values of individual properties will increase, will your tax your taxable status also increase and that's not that's not what is envisioned you know it's yeah. it's envisioned that we are going to have a lot more users a lot more intensity in the downtown that's that's the anticipation okay and you know I, I have had um, a number of opportunities to speak with individual people and I welcome that um, you know I recently met with um, the owner of the diner and he just said to me Aileen just get this done get this done we need to do it and you know he's been here a long time <laughs> he knows and it's not it's it, you know again i feel like the job of the town hall was of the, the town board was to put this project uh, together to do the uh, appropriate research to find the best possible scenario and to put it out to the people that that will be benefit that will benefit and will pay for it so that's the goal and did you guys estimate the the average cost to connect because, yeah, I mean, we see the sewer rent, and we, but there, there's another cost. Right, there to, is. To the there's that, that plumbing cost. So that's going to depend based on the property. And how um, far you are. From how line. far you are, and also decisions that you make. Now, we, got, we have a lot of properties here that, um, so interesting, fun fact, the average size of a property in this district is less than a third of an acre. Most of these are really small properties. We have some bigger ones, but most of these are really small properties. And they're, you know, they're sort of constrained by whatever's there. If there's a building someone built there a long time ago, it is what it is. Um, making decisions, and this is a property owner decision, about where those connections are made, that plumbing connection ma is made, is really important. You can just say, listen, I've got a building there. I just want to make it the cheapest, shortest distance 
and that's your decision. In those cases where you're pretty close to the to the sewer pipe, you're looking at you know three four thousand dollars something like that. That's a pretty typical cost. We do a lot of these projects. That's a pretty normal cost. Further away, going to cost more. On the other hand, you may look at your property and say, you know, some this maybe the way the building is situated in the site or the way the parking is is not super convenient. Maybe you say, you know what, I'd rather have my connection over on the property line. So then in the future, if I want to sell this property, somebody can come in, demo the building, get rid of the parking and build something else. And I haven't put this sewer in the way, right? So there's a couple of different ways to look at it. So the cost is going to vary based on the decision that's made by the property owner. But every property owner makes that decision individually. So the original question I asked you just while you're here, it, it, can you think of another town that you've worked on or your firm has worked on that's similar in size and scope to this in the last 10 years maybe that that has come out of it and you see some results Do you, so specific, um, like a specific name or? if you get on the three-way and you go and you're on the other side of the river and you go up to Catskill you get off the Catskill exit you're in beautiful downtown Leeds and or Jefferson Heights depending on which direction you go if you go towards Wyndham you're in Leeds, and if you go towards the village of Catskill and the Hudson River, you're in Jefferson Heights. We just finished a $15 million sewer project where we connected all of that land was on septic systems, all of it. So we connected all of that whole entire community down to the wastewater treatment plant in the village of Catskill and did some mitigation work at the village of Catskill plant. That project um, is just about finished we have like 10 more commute properties to connect and we have to do a little bit more work at the wastewater treatment plant um, that's an area where the ability to pay for a project like this is substantially diminished um, median household incomes here are substantially higher than they are there um, the cost to the average resident there median household income is about fifty thousand dollars a year that's half above half below fifty thousand dollars a year it's about a thousand dollars a year for sewer for them they couldn't wait for it to happen because they all recognized a lot of these folks were owning they owned houses that were built um, right after World War II and they had a septic system and a well the wells have been replaced with public water but the problem is you know grandma dies and now we own this little house in Jefferson Heights New York and we want to sell it can't get a mortgage because they can't prove that the septic system works mm. so there were all of these you know, because there are a lot of first-time home buyers, so they're Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and they require that you prove the septic system works. And they, you know, blue dye everywhere. So um, there was actually fairly substantial public support. There were some people who said, you know, this is going to be a big problem for me. I can't afford this. Um, I will tell you that some of them, the minute the sewer was available, they were the first people to apply to get their plumbing done to connect because um, they sort of didn't believe it was going to happen because that's another place where they talked about doing sewers for over 40 years. Um, the hamlet of Dwaynesburg in Schenectady County, where Route 20 and Route 7 come together, that whole hamlet, it's kind of outside the village of Delanson, was also on um, septic systems, and the difference there is they also all had drinking water wells on their teeny tiny little less than quarter acre lots. If you're familiar with that area at all, there's a pizza place called Jonathan's. Behind the pizza place is a little airport, and there was a swale back there. And in the summertime, if you were in the back parking lot at Jonathan's, you could barely breathe. And that's another area where incomes were extremely low, and they wanted a sewer system forever and ever and ever. And the cost to the average property owner is going to be about $1,000 a year. Now it's less than we're talking here, but these are homeowners. They're not businesses. And again, that project was just finished about two years ago. Um, and they are seeing some properties that had not been able to be sold are being sold now. They are seeing some revitalization. Um, these projects that were done as part of New York City's watershed in places like Wyndham and Hunter and Fleischman's and a bunch of those communities, if you remember them 20 years ago, they are a shadow. They were a shadow of what they are today in terms of the investment. It does make a difference. Public infrastructure makes a huge difference. And I know it can be difficult because you're here and you're a property owner, but developers and people who want to invest their money, and that's kind of what you want. You want people from the outside to come in and drop their dollars here and make you better. Um, they're looking for public infrastructure. They're looking for that. So we have a number of these um, where we've done very, where we've had very similar circumstances. Your challenge is your linear. There's no density. 
So there's no easy way to pick up a lot of people with one pipe. You have a lot of rock, which is expensive. There's no neighboring wastewater treatment plant to connect to. It's really far away and really expensive. So this is a challenging corridor. But we're seeing a lot of this. We see, you know, if you think about it, the Clean Water Act was adopted in the in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and a lot of sewer infrastructure was built 40 years ago. A lot of that needs to be upgraded, and there's millions and millions of dollars being spent doing that. But what we're really seeing is that you have the village or the town that had the sewer plant from 40 years ago, and there's a hamlet outside. And the hamlet is dying and has no investment and needs something. And part of the solution to that is to have public infrastructure to get that investment to happen there. So, so yes. Um, Public infrastructure definitely assists in, um, you know, in, in the economy. It does. I'd like to give others a chance. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Charles. You. And actually, Charles, you bring up a good point because you were on our original committee uh, when we did cre uh, creating the town center, and there was a lot of economic research that we did uh, in that during that time. We should put that up on the website too. Do we already, do we have it up there? Yeah, I think people would find that data interesting in terms of. Um, what this area can support based on this economic research. So uh, yeah. thanks for bringing that point up. Market, Is that yeah. what it was, the market study? Yep. So it's hpdowntown.com. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Bob Parkett. I don't think I really need this because my voice booms, but a um, little bit different perspective here. Uh, I happen to live over on the Hudson area, which is across the Crom Elbow Creek. Um, had my backgrounds and a long time ago real estate and for many many years after that I sell pumps for a living sewage wastewater uh, clean water first question is obviously you did a lot of due diligence to figure out where to put this nothing near the Hudson I guess I mean you've got gravity you've got sand you got everything you need to build a, a less expensive plant um, nothing at all down by the Hudson, like Germantown. I went to a Germantown plant that's brand new and they're near the railroad tracks right across the street. And we it's built all that plant. <laughs> you did, good, good job, by the way. My, yeah. my pumps are in there, too. So. <laughs> there you Thank go. you. <laughs> um, we did. We looked, at, we wanted to get in the Hudson River in the worst way. Mm -hmm. So, what this gentleman's talking about is that the discharge standard that you have from your treatment plant um, drives the cost. So if we can make water that can go in the Hudson River versus water that has to keep fish alive in the Crum Elbow Creek, it's cheaper. So we actually did, the town owns some land down by the train station, um, and we did look at that um, property. It is unfortunately very small, very long and narrow, hard to build a treatment plant under those conditions. Um, we looked at other locations on the west side as possible um, possible places to put a wastewater treatment plant. Um, we did do that evaluation. Again, we're, get really, we're getting farther and farther away from the service area, so it's that balancing of costs. Um, there wasn't other public land available, and um, you know, we, it could be looked at again, um, for sure, but we did evaluate that because that was the first thing we were thinking. We even looked yeah. at the, um, if you're familiar, the water plant, the Dutchess County Water Authority, waste, water and wastewater authority. Water plant has a discharge line to the Hudson from their site because they have to discharge their water right. someplace. Um, we looked at possibly utilizing that same right of way and sharing that. Um, it didn't, for a variety of reasons, it didn't pan out. Um, but we did look at those options because that was our very first thing was treatments. Get, we, again, we started with subsurface, which would be the least expensive, and we worked our way up. So, okay. so uh, one clarification. So. A vote will be come to this to the 109 affected or the town? Just the 109, 109. property okay. owners that would be part okay. of the district. Okay, because I'm a little curious. I mean, I live again on the right, the other side, the, I guess it would be the east side of the Crum Elbow. Obviously, anybody on that east side of the Crum Elbow, you're probably not going to run a line through the river, over the river, under the river anytime soon. So everybody on that east side has zero benefit. But we have a little bit of a fallout with the treatment plan being right really close to everywhere we live, and that's north-south for a couple, three miles. Um, I do know you, you, you say that, and first of all, wastewater treatment plant's a good thing. It's where you put it and how you design it. That's the hard part, and that's what you're trying to do. So I commend all your efforts and time. It's a countless number of hours. But I do know from my real estate days that if, if, if part of the town is on w wastewater, I've got a wastewater treatment plant pretty close to me, and I'm on septic when I go try to sell, or I, uh, my property value actually 
doesn't increase. So it becomes an issue there. You need to be on the system. Yeah. And it, now that's my last one, and I'll get out. <laughs> the future. So what's the future plan? Is this your first water treatment plant, and then the plan would have another one somewhere else and really try to pick up all the town on that east side of, of the Crumb Elbow? Is that a future? You know, I don't really think so. Uh, I okay. think that the what we are try, what our what our goal is to is to create a downtown, right? And right. a downtown doesn't go for three miles, right? You know, I think that's the advantage of the plan that we're we've come up with. It's really concentrating the development in the ta the traditional town center. And you know, when Charles asked what other towns that we could refer refer to, I I think that if we look at um, the municipalities that have villages, right, like. Rhinebeck, Red Hook, um, uh, Fishkill, Wappinger. Uh, Wappinger's actually, they're still struggling with their sewer, as is Red Hook. They're still trying to achieve right. it. But, um, you know, I, I think what you want to see is like this concentrated, dense development in the, in, in the center, and then have it uh, somewhat less developed on the outskirts. So I think that's really why we're focusing on, on this area and not envisioning it throughout the entire town and you know we did explore uh, way early on whether it would make sense to connect the residences uh, on the east side or the west side of route 9 uh, because then we'd have a lot more rate payers right, right. but it didn't end up uh, really reducing it was the cost. actually more expensive yeah. yeah because of all the infrastructure that would have to be built to do it sometimes Substations, sometimes yeah. adding more makes it less expensive sometimes adding more makes it more mm -hmm. expensive in this case it was more expensive and so I think that that's why we didn't we didn't go that route, but um, you know. But to speak to the property value issue, um, you know, I think when when we compare our home values in Hyde Park versus other municipalities that do have a more vibrant downtown, I think we see a, a, a fair discrepancy between Hyde Park's values and those other communities: Red Hook, Rhinebeck, Millbrook. Those, and and I think that's partially because, despite all our wonderful assets, which I choose to live here, and I love Hyde Park. I don't want to live anywhere else, but I think there is that missing component. It's the thing that people look for, and I think that it does drive, and it will, I believe it will help property values because people want to live in a vibrant place where they can walk and get food and, and have some shopping and where it's attractive. And, you know, we, we all recognize what a drain on our community these vacant spaces are. You know, you look at the property across the street that's been vacant for 10 years, and the property owner has it on the, had it on the market for four point two million dollars. You know, like we, if you live on Hudson Drive, you you're certain that that's driving, that's impacting the value of your property. We all know that, and that's that's the struggle. Like, how do we fix this problem without bringing the infrastructure to make these changes? That property would have definitely sold if there was if there was the capacity for sewer. Uh, but without it, it's very limited. What can they do? So I think that it's it's maybe a more indirect uh, um, uh, relationship between that vibrancy and your home values. But I think it's real. Mm -hmm. and, and oh, you thanks. Need, uh, local follow -up, I'm not sure I understood what I heard before. And I'm can you come to the mic, please? Yeah, could you? Yeah, come on up to the mic, Sarah. No, no, you're making great uh, points. <laughs> Just a follow up. Sure. Um, I'm because I'm not sure what I heard before. I didn't make it clear that uh, that I also live on Hudson Drive, so I'm across the you know the uh, oh. East Market, yeah, East Market Street. Um, and I thought at first when I asked about the property values, you said that the uh, the property values were going up, but I thought I just heard that if you're not connected to it, you go down. I don't and know that, that you go down, but you don't. And, you're and not. That, that, you're not benefited. So you're, so yeah. that that's a very critical point because those houses on Hudson Drive, Stoutenburg, right in that area, as you know, drive the tax base here. So I just want to very much understand that. So I will, so I will tell you, I, we work in many, many, many towns. And one of the things that I do very often is I'll go talk to um, the clerk in the planning department or whatever, and I'll say, so when people are looking to buy houses and they come and they talk to you, what are they asking you about? Never had a single soul say, is my potential property next door to a wastewater treatment plant? It's never, cause it, because it is, I know everybody's kind of like, it's going to be there. The reality is, new home buyer, they're not looking for that. But are you on a sewer or are you not on a sewer? That's a big difference. 
we have not seen, and again, our, our work is here in the area and we didn't do any statistical analysis, we have not seen properties outside of a sewer district decline per se. We have seen access to sewer improves property values. You know, it does. actually, um, I can refer you to Pine Brook, right? Do you know where Pine Brook is? The, it's off of 9G, um, uh, past South uh, St. Andrews on the right. It's a nice, okay. nice little uh, subdivision in there. And they have a wastewater treatment plant as part of their project. And those property values have really held. Mm. Even that, I would definitely think. I but would defi I, I think it's also worth going there because at the Market Street meeting, uh, we had some residents who lived in the condo very close to their wastewater treatment plant. And they said they had no ill effects. And they were supportive. They voted yes for the, uh, the for connecting to East, the East Market. So it might be worth going, just taking a drive there, through there. That plant was just recently redone by the Water Authority. We transferred all our districts. and um, But, you know, I think that's interesting because it's actually, it's really quite expensive for them, uh, their, their sewer treatment. And the town, the Water Authority is looking to connect that project uh, along with Holt Road uh, to the water plant as a potential project, which I think would be really good for them. But uh, it's interesting that they, that, that um, development has held its value even when our well, property values I would had totally really expect that it would increase the value mm -hmm. of those not connected the concern I had because I thought I heard as those who are not connected which would be right now some valuable properties would go down because they're not I don't think it should so. Mary Beth said that they'd go down they're not going to real they're not going to have the benefit of having the Understand. infrastructure thank you sure sure Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike Wajda. Um, I got a question. If we form the sewer district and it turns out there's no additional funding, can you just ban the sewer district? You know, that's a good You asked that a lot before. Of easement, a lot of ease, a lot of minds about who's worried about this, and we're all worried about it. Sure. So. So, yeah, there's, there's, you know, what, what a sewer district is, is a taxing jurisdiction. Right, so we're gonna, f you know, we've got this little schedule up here, and we've got review and approval by the state comptroller's office. You know, apply for this financing. Um, we've had communities where we've gotten there. Someone said, you know, we're really looking at sewers in X Y Z place, and we'll start doing a bunch of research, and we'll go, you have a sewer district, you have had it since 1980. They go, oh yeah, we formed it, and then we didn't have the money, so we didn't use it. So the answer is yes. I mean, it's a taxing jurisdiction, just like any other one. Um, just because it's formed doesn't mean that shovels go in the ground tomorrow. There are many decisions that the community has to make, including, you know, you're looking at really pretty, you know, ink on sheets of paper that's worth about 25 cents. Um, you know, it's not, it's, you have to have a plan, you have to have ideas, you have to have concepts, they have to be real that people could actually build, but there's a long way to go before you get to building anything, and I think, you know, the, the board can certainly has a lot of discretion in whether they move forward with a project after the district is formed. Yeah, I, I, I recall you asking that uh, when we met last year, and I think what you're looking for is something uh, like a, a safety release valve, Absolutely. right? Like, yeah. so, hey, we put this all together, now we've applied for the WIA, and, and I guess what you're, you're seeking, though, would be some sort of formal agreement whereby if the town doesn't receive X, then we won't go forward, is that, is, yeah, is, is that what you're, on this whole yeah, thing. I, I don't know. I don't think we can have yeah, that. Yeah, that, that I don't. Have yeah, the taxing jurisdiction is a taxing jurisdiction. However, again, there are many opportunities along the way for the town. You know, the one thing I, that we didn't talk about before, and maybe it bears some discussion, um, creating a sewer district in towns is done through two methods. One method is on action of the town board. The town board does a study and decides it is in the public's interest to have a sewer district and the town board acts on that. And once they've done that, um, according to state law, that decision is subject to something called permissive referendum, meaning that the taxpayers, those 109 properties, would have to come and petition to have the right to vote on it. So that's method like one, right? Method two is on petition of the property owners. 
property owners show up and say, we really, really want this. Town board, please do this for us. And the town board goes, okay, and they go do it. Now, in between those two things is where we are. In New York state law, anything that's subject to permissive referendum, any action of a town that's subject to permissive referendum, meaning the board makes a decision and folks can come who are affected and say, I want to vote, and they have to compel it, petition, complicated process, can also be subject to something called mandatory referendum, where it's automatic. The board says, in our judgment, as the supervisor said, we've done the legwork because we've heard for years that this was needed. We're going to put this back. But instead of making people come and ask for that vote, the board has said, no, we want the, the, the property owners to support this. This is a decision of the property owners. We've done the legwork, all of this research, engineering reports, all kinds of things, but now you guys decide. The fact that this, the board has decided to make this a mandatory referendum, meaning everybody gets to vote and say yes or no, who's affected, I think is a really important thing. It's part of that safety valve that you're looking for. So I recognize that we've said, you know, in order for us to go forward and look for more grants, these certain kinds of grants, we need the district formed. But if you think about it, there are a lot of jumping off places. One of them is the referendum fails. If the referendum fails, the process stops. That's it. You know, somebody could resurrect it again. I think this is time number several that that's happened. Um, but, you know, the process stops. Another one is the district is formed. The community applies for grants and low-cost financing. The numbers don't drop. There's more meetings. There's more what do people think. And, you know, perhaps it's that it doesn't go forward. I don't think, and, and, and the attorney should jump in, I don't believe there's any way like in the formation of the district where one of the little, and so we find X, Y, and Z can say, and if we don't get funding, the district is informed. We have that review and approval by the Office of the State Comptroller up there. Yeah, it won't make it through that process. It's, it's a, it's a pass-fail kind of operation. Um, so I think that's, I think that's, I think that's yeah. the answer. Yeah. But I, I, I think you're uh, exactly right. The, the, the pressure release valve, the, the safety valve is the vote. Okay. You know, you guys just really need to, to hone in on, on the value of this. Um, and, you know, have confidence that we will do everything in our power to lower the cost for you. You know, that's, I think, the, oh, the doing that already, I think obviously. that's the reality yeah. that we can offer, you know. My other question on the rent use on, the si on that mm -hmm. side. So the bike goes by your place, you decide not to hook up, obviously you're going to be paying the taxes on it. <clears throat> you're not mandated to hook up to it, correct? Right. So um, there are those two charges, the, the debt service charge and the rent. Um, the debt service charge ends up on every property, whether you connect or not. So that's part of the deal. The rent is the operation and maintenance cost. If you're not connected, you're not paying that operation and maintenance cost. Um, one of the things that the town will do is, um, you already have a sewer use law, but you'll be looking at your sewer use law. The sewer use law will make a determination about things like, are you, quote, required to connect? If you are required to connect, what's the procedure? Who connects? Is there an application fee? All of those kinds of things. Um, in our experience, we will we traditionally hear people who will say, well, yeah, the district was formed and I'm paying debt service, but I'm not going to connect. Generally speaking, they usually end up connecting because first of all, you're paying for something you're not getting. That's kind of a tough nut to swallow. And secondly, the reason the project's being done is because people need need to do something with their septic systems and need to do something with this and, and um, from an environmental perspective, if nothing else. So. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we were recently at the Association of Towns, and one of the seminars we attended was on grant funding, and it sounded like a couple of communities have used CDBG grants for connection fees for individual properties, so that's something that we would continue to look on, at, at look to, you know, can we get grant funding for your specific property to connect? Right. So a couple things on CBDG, just so everybody doesn't get too excited. Um, commercial properties don't qualify. Oh, oh, it's residences only. There's an income requirement and it has to be verified on a resident by resident okay. basis. You have to be 51% low and moderate income um, and it's income qualified. There's a lot of paperwork and forms. We've done a lot of that work in a lot but of communities. You're right. You're right. This, really this community it. here, um, about 90% of the connections there were done through a CBDG program mm -hmm. because they're very, very, very poor. 
Um, but unfortunately, oh, community development right. block yeah. grant for connections doesn't apply to commercial properties. All right, well, then I'm going to go to the county. And see. <laughs> <laughs> I got one more quick question. Out of the 109 parcels, okay, some have multiple parcels, owners have multiple parcels. How many actual votes are there going to be? Um, yeah, so that if you have multiple properties, you only get one vote. So like the total pool of voters, yeah, how many votes you know, be? it's on that table one, and I don't remember it off the top of my head. How many do you remember? Um, I want to say it's like 67, but it's something I, like I, that. I really yeah. don't. I'll know that. I can, yeah. you, you can, the map plan and report will be on the website, the website. tomorrow. Yep. So uh, you can take a look. But yep. uh, I, I have a few. What was the question? How many, uh, how many properties will vote? How, because there's so many right. redundancies. Yeah. Do you remember off the top of your head? No, well, we have to create, we're going to create a, a registration, a basically a, a formal document that'll, that'll figure that out and, uh, okay. and, just and advise something. the public as yeah. to how many votes and I how can many, get back you know, to that. Right. Thank you. That. Sure, sure, Mike. Would anyone else like to ask questions or? Um, okay. Uh, all right. So, um, Mary Beth, I want to thank you. Yeah. And, and I want to thank the public for coming out, asking excellent questions. Really appreciate it. March 9th will be the public hearing. Um, and we'll have all the information up on the website that you can peruse and uh, look forward to seeing everyone then. And we're going to continue with our meeting. Okay. Can we just uh, clarify that it's going to be on the town's website, not necessarily HP d yes. downtown? Okay, yes. It'll be on the town's website, Town of Hyde Park, not on HP downtown yet, but that's coming. It'll eventually coming. be on the downtown initiative website, HP downtown. Okay. So uh, are we ready? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming. All right. Um, you know, shall I, shall I ask Mary Beth, should we, should we just go ahead with our meeting? Yeah, let's, let's just go ahead with it. Yeah, let's just go ahead. Yeah. All right. Neil, want to yep. go ahead? Resolution 224-1 uh, of 2020. Yeah. Resolution authorizing the adoption of order for public hearing on the establishment of the Route 9 Sewer District. Second. And uh, maybe we should do a roll call on that, Donna. Yes. Councilman Krupnik. Aye. Councilman Ray. Aye. Councilman Marine. Aye. Supervisor Ward. Aye. Resolution 224-2 of 2020. Resolution. Wait, uh, uh, hold on a second. Can, I, I can't can deal with we that. ask everybody to take their conversation outside? <laughs> We, we can move the chart. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> uh, sh do we need a roll call on the seeker? Yeah, yeah, let's go ahead, John. No, we don't need it on the seeker? No, okay. All right. Okay. Yes, all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 224-3 two, of 2020. Resolution accepting amended local law and town core design and development standards and continuing local law adoption process for local law C of the year 2020 now entitled a local law to enact certain amendments to chapter 108 zoning of the code of the town of Hyde Park to create a new zoning district entitled town core and revising the zoning chapter 108 to rename town center historic district the corridor business zoning district and a second second and all in favor aye, aye. 
Resolution 224-4 of 2020. Resolution authorizing the Town of Hyde Park Town Board to accept the 2020 Public Works Labor and Equipment Rates for the Town of Hyde Park. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 224-5 of 2020. Resolution authorizing the Town of Hyde Park Recreation Director, Robert Pollard, to attend the 2020 American Camp Association Tri-State Conference Tuesday, March 10th through Thursday, March 13th, 2020, in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 224-6 of 2020. Resolution authorizing Town of Hyde Park Building Inspector Donald Westmeyer and Deputy Building Inspector Richard Lungendike to attend the Hudson Valley Code Enforcement Officials Education Conference April 22nd through the 24th, 2020. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 224-7 of 2020. Resolution authorizing the town supervisor to execute an agreement with the County of Dutchess to provide police patrols in connection with driving while intoxicated laws for 2020. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So next resolution is, <clears throat> it says 225, I think it's 224-8 uh, of 2020. Resolution authorizing the town supervisor to execute an agreement with the County of Dutchess to provide coordinated driving while intoxicated checkpoints in designated areas within the town of Hyde Park. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 224-9 of 2020. Resolution authorizing the Town of Hyde Park Supervisor to sign the Acquisition Agreement Lease and Maintenance Agreement with Cannon Solutions of America for copier equipment for the Town of Hyde Park Justice Court. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 224-10 of 2020. Resolution authorizing the Town of Hyde Park Town Board to reappoint Carol Clearwater to the Town of Hyde Park Board of Ethics. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, um, would anyone like to speak on any of the resolutions uh, that we just passed? Or any other matter of town business? Okay, um, <laughs> and does anyone else have any, uh, any uh, new or old business to discuss? Yep. Um, we do have some new business to discuss, but we'll, we'll, we'll be thinking about that. But definitely want to invite people to uh, the public hearing March 9th at 7 p.m. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And may I have a motion to adjourn? Make a motion. And a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks for coming, Howie. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Hey, Howie. Hey, Bobby. How are you? Nine Good. 11. Good. Thanks for coming.